Good evening and welcome to the Smart Entrepreneurship Decoded Core. This show every week brings you people from diverse backgrounds and we talk about what they do was in relation to entrepreneurs. When I used to work for a large Fortune 500 company, life was much simpler. Firstly, at the end of every month, I would get a paycheck, which made me very happy. Secondly, all I had to do in the 17 years I was in corporate life was to do my job a little better than my colleague and I would get a rise and a, maybe a promotion. I didn't have to know everything. I just needed to know that piece of work given in one of the departments, one small piece of work and do it better. I didn't have to worry about the company strategy, branding, things like that. Those for me as an employee was a birthright to just criticize sitting in the cafeteria. Then I became an entrepreneur and suddenly I had to do everything. I had to think, find the money to do the business, find and retain employees, find shareholders, manage them, find clients, create a product, find a problem to solve for. Life was tough. When I went to investors for the first time, they would ask me, so what is your business strategy? I didn't have a clue. I'd heard the word. I studied it in college, but I didn't know what it meant. Later, as I got better educated in that subject, I now watch others fumble on that. You ask them what is the strategy and they'll start giving you plans or they'll start giving you some theory, which it makes no sense. I have always wondered, can strategy really be taught? There are only seven and a half percent of people as per research reports who are who can be called strategic thinking people. Universities will always say it can be taught because otherwise the universities will shut down. But can strategy really be taught? Can strategic thinking be taught or is it something inborn? Thankfully, I don't have to answer all these questions tonight. I have got an accomplished guest, guest with me to answer that for us. He's joining us tonight from Sydney, Australia, Mr. Mahesh Anjeti. He has spent decades helping some of the largest brands and names in the world to get their branding right and get their strategic positioning right. So I will start with my first question to him on, can strategic thinking be taught? It's a very tricky question, Lalin, um, because unlike a lot of people, I think strategy is composed of two ingredients. One is analysis, which is a lot of number work and, and looking at research, interpreting that. The other aspect is creativity. I think every strategy involves creative thinking. I think the first part to a large extent can be taught mm -hmm. and acquired. It's the creative thinking part that is more difficult, not because it is more difficult, but because most people believe that they are not creative. Okay, and that's I think an that's, interesting, yeah, that's that's an interesting well, take on this. So yeah. tell me something, you work with a lot of leaders, right? And you see good leaders, you see leaders struggling. Among the successful strategic leaders, do you see certain habits or traits that are common in them? Some things they do as a habit or some particular way they operate? I, I am not sure if I can pinpoint a habit, but certainly clarity, clarity of thinking is something that is probably essential for a good strategist because there's all this so much of noise around you and you want to be able to do so many things because your competitor is doing it. In fact, I again divide strategy into two components. One is knowing what to do, which is a clarity, but equally choosing what not to do. And that's usually the more difficult part of it. In fact, uh, during COVID, perhaps uh, if you knew what you had to do, you probably had to think more seriously about what not to do, given all the constraints in terms of you know cost constraints and people constraints and things like that. So it, it, I think clarity of thinking um, and focus is probably the single most important trait. Again, I've seen that in a lot of people. I mean, I used to uh, work for 
the chairman of ITC, who was then the chairman of hotels, uh, Yogi Deveshwar, and he was one of those people who had a very, very singular focus in terms of what he wants to, wanted to achieve. So that I certainly believe is, is a necessary um, sort of attribute for a good strategist or strategy yeah. leader. It's interesting you say that, you know, very early in my career, my boss, uh, maybe 20 years ago, we had started a HRBPO company mm. and we were just on the threshold of succeeding or failing. And he said, Nalin, decide what not to do. What are the things you'll drop? Yeah. Yeah. That is more important than deciding what you will do. Just cut away the noise. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you're in right. My, in, right. Yeah. in my experience, I have noticed that one of the greatest gifts I don't know if that can be taught, but one of the greatest gifts a good leader has is clarity of thought. Even in all the noise and the clutter, they find one surprise truth and one absolute straight line to follow, which, which is remarkable. Yeah, yeah. And you need to send a clear signal through all that noise to your people so that everybody is on board with that strategy. You know? Yeah, very so true. Why, why do I work a lot with young entrepreneurs? And they stumble on the strategy question. They'll throw plans at you. They'll throw all jargon at you. They'll throw statistics at you. If you could just demystify and tell us, what is strategy? Yeah. My very simple or probably simplistic view of what strategy is, I look at it as a bridge, a bridge that connects the capabilities and resources you have within your organization and the opportunities that exist externally outside in the marketplace. And that bridge um, can be a one meter wide timber bridge or it could be an eight lane highway. And that depends on how much you can afford to do. But you've got to be very clear as to where you're going and how you're going to get there. And that, yeah. I think, is probably the crux of, of strategy. But more recently, I've come to believe, uh, after I saw Harry Potter, uh, I don't know if you've seen Harry Potter, where in the Hogwarts school, they have all these staircases which keep shifting all the time. So that bridge also tends to shift a little. It tends to sort of change direction sometimes. And therefore, it's not a fixed bridge between point A and point B, but it's, it's almost more dynamic than what it has been in the past. And that's because of the changes that are happening in the environment. You still know where, where you're going, but you probably may have to make some mid-course corrections in order to be able to get there. Yeah. So that, that would be my simple definition of strategy. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a quite an interesting one, especially the changing part of it. And I'll delve in that a bit more in a moment. For a lot of uh, young startups, there's a huge failure rate. But leaving aside the failure rates, whatever it is, the ones who do survive the first two, three years, there is a very high stagnation rate in them. A lot of them tend to stagnate. And that is where... When you say stagnate, you mean not being able to scale up or...? They don't scale up. They don't yeah. scale up. And very often, investors are advising them that your strategy is not clear. You don't have a strategy. And the entrepreneur is thinking, how did I get till here? Is that a time they need uh, external help just to get perspective or do more of the same thing? I think, I mean, again, this is probably a very simplistic explanation. When you launch a product as, as a startup, you obviously identified a problem and you have come up with a solution for the problem. So the people who already have that problem would be your early adopters and they, your, the majority or whatever. After some time, I don't think startups invest as much of time, effort, dollars in terms of making people aware of that need of that problem and the fact that the solution they have is able to sort of overcome that problem. So there's not enough work done in terms of building the brand to be able to be associated with that problem and solution. And that's why after some time, it tends to stagnate, you plateau and you don't, because you have to invest, even as a startup, you need to invest in the brand. And I don't think very many startups do that. That's probably the reason why they sort of run into this kind of a impasse. 
Yeah. Some of it is, you know, because uh, popular culture and media tends to glorify that garage startup, etc. Oh, yeah. Especially in countries like India, etc. I tell them, at least he have, has a garage. You don't even have a car. So yeah. if he started from a garage, at least he had a garage and that garage was in America. <laughs> or people say this guy was a school dropout. And I say yeah. he went to Wharton and dropped out. He didn't yeah. go to your local university and drop out. So there are these common myths, perceptions, biases, etc. And I agree with your point about not thinking through branding, uh, brand value and uh, strategy. But for an, uh, for an entrepreneur, what they are doing a lot of stuff, right? They have to really balance a lot of things. At what point should they think, let's say, 80% on strategy and brand value? Is it at the start, before they start? Is it in between? Or is it just a continuous process? I would probably be a little biased being being a brand strategist. Um, I would say it has to begin at the very beginning, at the very beginning. In fact, I my favorite quote, this is my own quote, is that a brand is not a function of marketing. It's the very foundation of the business. I think uh, if you know what your the problem you're trying to solve and the solution for it, that's where the brand starts. And to leave branding until much later would I think be the reason why we have some of those startups actually stagnating. I think you need to think about the brand from day one because that that is your promise and that is your delivery, and that both of them need to match. So I I, I wouldn't say you should it's. It's something that you can sort of start off halfway through the process. You've got to start from day one. One of the things that, you know, uh, entrepreneurs uh, struggle with is uh, when we are, they're asked, how will you reach a market? This is social media. But th that's really not a good enough answer. But they also struggle with the fact that there's so much clutter. I mean, at least I am from the generation where now in hindsight, branding and creating brands seemed a simpler thing to do. In this clutter today of influencers, social media, a uh, large proportion of millennials who, who are more worried about the ESG goals and things like that, they like to associate with brands like mm -hmm. that. Is there a particular way uh, people should think about this? Or is, does it, of course, it will depend on the target of market, but is there I, mean, I, want to, I want to take a step back to the previous question. And I think a lot of people seem to associate brand with the physical, the identity of, of your business or identity of the product, um, the logo, the tagline, um, the color scheme. But if you look at it more deeply, the brand is actually who you are, what you stand for, and importantly, uh, how you do things and how you behave. And if that is your brand, irrespective of whether you're a startup or whether you're a large company, I think you cannot but think about brand right from the beginning and say, okay, how do I communicate my brand to my target audience? And if you started doing that, it doesn't matter whether it's through social media or through traditional channels, as long as your target audience understands who you are, what you stand for, how you do things and how you behave then I think half the battle is won already. So I think that's an area where people don't invest as much time because you get so caught up in the operations in, in initially about you, you have to survive and then you have to grow. And in all this, you think branding is something which is sort of uh, extra, extraneous to your, but that is, that is the essence of your existence. You, you're right, you know, when you start out, it's a struggle. You're trying to, uh, mm. it's existential. Uh, you yeah, start getting yeah. a few customers. Until then, all you have worried about is, is the logo catchy enough? Do we have a yeah. tagline? Well, cut and paste a vision and mission statement, etc. But there comes a stage where you need to really step back, like you said, mm. and start thinking about who are we? What do we stand for? What is, what is our core? And then to your mind, what is that stage? Is that a... Uh, that tipping point is when you're about cash break even or you want to scale up or I'm, I know there's no right answer, but as I said, I, I'm probably biased because of my background. 
And I, I actually spend a lot of time with companies, especially even uh, startups. I mean, I do a lot of work with startups too, um, or even sort of companies which have been running for a few years and then want to be able to scale up. I think you need to have that conversation very, very early in the pace um, in terms of who you are, what you stand for. I have a very simple equation. This is um, identity, which is what people normally associate with brands is equal to ID plus entity. ID is who you are mm -hmm. and entity is the business. And the two of them need to sort of go together. You cannot separate one from the other. And I think startups are sort of uh, moved by, by the passion and, and the intent of, of the people. And if that intent and passion can come through everything that you do, then you don't have, you don't need to create a separate brand. That is your brand. Your product becomes the brand, your service becomes the brand, your people become the brand, you become the brand. So I, I think that separation is more artificial. We create that separation between brand and business, but brand and business are the same. Your experience, product experience is the brand and the brand is the product experience. So they're not two separate things. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think people need to start looking at brands from that kind of broader perspective. Something interesting you said there about uh, being uh, having personal branding, right? In mm -hmm. today's uh, hyper social world, uh, <laughs> at least in the initial years, uh, how important is it for the founder or founders to role model the personal branding? I mean, I again, I think we sometimes tend to overplay the importance of personality, um, language, competence, your diction, um, more than the substance. And, and, and I, I think that's probably almost inevitable. People tend to, like people say the first 30 seconds or 20 seconds of an interview, uh, the interviewer makes up their mind about whether they like you or don't uh, like you, I mean, which, is, which is unfortunate, but that's the way they work. I think it's, if you're really convincing and compelling in terms of what how you present, it doesn't really matter whether you, the, the personal brand again comes from the experience. And I think, and this is what I, I, I actually published a book, a uh, mini book of five years ago on brands. Um, it, it, it looks at brands from a business lens, not a marketing lens. And I, I talk about expression and experience. We tend to, place a lot of emphasis and importance on expression, but not on the experience. The, if the experience is good, that itself becomes the expression. But again, we try to sort of separate the two. They are, they're just one continuum. And I, I, I believe if you are able to express yourself, and, and quite often I have actually even in interviews picked people who may not have come across as, as sway and, you know, sort of, but um, you got to look at the, the internal um, substance rather than the external, ex the exterior. Yeah. Again, again, you said you know that people uh, form perceptions of other people very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. back in my day, life was mm -hmm. a little simpler. That whoever was meeting me did not form a perception till they actually physically met me. Maximum, mm -hmm. it would be a phone call on the voice. Today, before I meet a person. I know virtually everything about them. <laughs> yeah. So, so is, 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 there, is that something you can play positively or is that just a burden we have to live with? Because before you meet somebody, they formed all kinds of perceptions. I think it can, it can have both positive and negative impact. Uh, and I think sometimes we probably tend to place too much emphasis on what we see on, on social media, even, even including LinkedIn. I mean, I, I would probably check you out on LinkedIn and you would have checked me out on, on LinkedIn. And we tend to form opinions. In fact, there was one, once I was making a presentation to the Architects Association of Australia. And I said, look, you all would have made some, you would have had some impression of who I am before you saw me. Uh, because there would have been a blurb about, about who is the speaker. But the impression you take away is after I have interacted with you. That's what leaves a lasting impression. And I think we need to let people to be able to interact with us before we form our opinions. We tend to look at people's images, 
what other people have said and tend to, which is probably the downside of social media. I mean, I, I think it's it sort of sometimes tends to magnify that that initial impression and perhaps unfavorably quite often, True. sometimes maybe favorably too, but more often than not unfavorably, which I think is, is sort of, uh, we live in a very, very different world today to when we, you know, you and I grew up a long time so ago. I'm much older than you are, I suppose. <laughs> On a, on a lighter note, uh, often after seeing somebody on LinkedIn and their picture, and when I meet them in person, I have to figure out if it's the same person because the picture on LinkedIn is so <laughs> photoshopped and so nicely put there. I didn't have a beard, I think, in my LinkedIn <laughs> picture, and now sporting a beard. Yeah, it's just uh, COVID and not being able to go to a barber, even not getting my hair cut, you know. So it will be fascinating to hear from you. Uh, a successful and an unsuccessful story around branding that you have experienced? Oh my God, that is so vast. I mean, it's amazing the number of brands I may have touched, maybe a few hundreds at least, I, I would think. Um, Any one that was uh, close I, to I have, I have some favorites. Uh, it's, it's strange that, and they come from different sectors. They come from tourism, they come from beauty, they come from um accessories for children so if i were to pick one i mean in terms of challenge there was one one project that i did for tourism australia probably 12 years ago which was actually branding a volcano that has been dormant for 23 million years and, wow. and make a dormant volcano a living brand and that was a really challenging project in fact Two days ago on ABC TV, that that region was was actually showcased as part of a program back to nature or something like that. That was a very challenging. Uh, it was challenging not just because of of that, the fact that I had to uh, bring to life a dormant volcano, which is now not a volcano, but it is actually a rainforest. But the fact that there were twelve stakeholders and branding is such a such a subjective area that everybody has very strong likes and dislikes. And to get that diversity of people to reach consensus on what the brand should be was almost an impossible task. And to bring it up, I mean, I'm really, really sort of fortunate having, having done that. Um, there is a very small island uh, of, you must have heard of Norfolk Island, which is sort of yes. between New Zealand and uh, New Caledonia. Yeah. And it's an island which is just three miles by five miles, five kilometers by eight kilometers. And I sort of branded it as, as a world in itself where people could go and spend seven days, you know? So that was another challenging project. But then there was a beauty pr uh, product out, out of uh, Ghana, this entrepreneur who started a beauty brand uh, for dark skin people. That was an amazing project too. I mean, there's so many projects I really, really like. Do you want me? What aspects do you want me to talk about? So that... let's so let's uh, talk. Look at it differently. So when you work with all these people, it's not mm. as if you tell them what to do and they get it immediately. No, is, no, no. What is that? No. What is that one barrier that you have to really get past? The two. I think if I were to advise somebody, a youngster who is in, in, in this business. I think we all tend to get so fixated on the brand. We want to create this brand, present it to the client, ask them whether they, they like it. I think that's the wrong way to do it. The first, the fundamental thing you need to do is get people to agree on the strategy. What should, who are you trying to reach? What is it that you're trying to communicate? Once you sort of get agreement on the strategy, then create a brand and ask people, is this on strategy or not? People would be less subjective when you ask them whether this is on strategy or not, but whether you, you show them a brand for whatever in whatever form, logo, colors, lettering, typeface, whatever, they tend to sort of get obsessed with the physicality of it, but not the underlying strategy that goes behind it. So get people to agree on the strategy and then ask, present the brand to them and say, is this on strategy or not on strategy? If it's not on strategy, go back to the drawing board. 
But once they say it's on strategy, it doesn't matter whether they have specific likes and dislikes about it because everybody would like something or, and dislike something else. And that liking and disliking that is actually a good thing for the brand because it creates sharp edges. So it's not a neutral brand that everybody says, oh, it's okay. Some people might love it and some people might hate it, but all of them agree that it is on strategy. And I think that's so, the key thing. Yeah, I think I get what you're trying to convey there. When, when leadership teams work and the company is like a river flowing through at fast pace, mm. uh, for conversations like this, do you think they can actually happen in the office or you need to really step out from the daily humdrum? It probably helps to get away uh, because when you are in the office, there are too many distractions. And then I think people tend to leave uh, the meeting and say, oh, I have got something urgent to attend to and then come back and then you lose the train of thought. It does help to sort of have focused attention away from the humdrum of your daily working life. Um, how far is it practical to do that all the time is, is a different question, but I would definitely prefer that kind of, uh, because I think you also need the right environment for people to True. sort of make those choices and not be pressured because of everything else that's happening uh, at that time. But definitely, I think it would help if you sort of moved away from your, you know, sort of usual place of work. Yeah. I so let so. me come to my final question, which is a little more personal. Yeah, yeah. How did you decide to become a strategist? I mean, it's not as if you walk into college and say, I want to become a strategist. How, what was your journey like? I think I, I realized that, and this is something which uh, probably going back to my college days, um, I did my honors in physics and I wanted to be a physicist actually, learn German because I wanted to go to Germany and do my masters and, and PhD in physics something changed uh, I went into business school but the real um, trigger for that came from the realization that I have a, a brain that is equally evolved both on the left side and the right side and usually people have a dominant side they, they are either very analytical in their thinking and very creative or very creative in their thinking and I realized but probably I was about 17 or 18 at that time. Wow. I realized that I had this ability to sort of almost almost ambidextrous in that sense. And I thought strategy was, was a discipline where I would actually do well because strategy, unlike, and, and at that, that time strategy was perceived purely as an analytical thing. It was more about analysis. It was not about synthesis. It was not about creativity. And, uh, but I felt that there was an opportunity for, because I said, look, if every company did analysis the same way, came to the same conclusions, they all followed the same strategy. So how you, how you have differentiation in the marketplace? How do you get a larger share of the profits in, in, in the industry? So you've got to have something which is different from what others have done. And I think that was what drove me towards strategy. And right from my very first job, I was sort of more and more, and more interested in looking at the strategic side of things. And, so Just it, on it, that, I will ask you one more question because yeah, you yeah, touched yeah. upon something very important. So in, in the today's world, with all this computing power, heaps of data, big data, is uh, strategy and brand value being dehumanized to an extent? And you said, right, people looking at the same data coming to the same conclusions. I, and I think sometimes I, I actually worry about this uh, there's so much more data that's available, whether you talk about big data or even in terms of artificial intelligence. I think we are probably abrogating our responsibility to think because we think uh, a lot of our decisions are almost being sort of given to us on a, on a silver platter because the data has been analyzed. And the more we, we get into that mode, the less likely we are going to exercise our own independent thinking. And I think we will still be, there's a lot of lot of opportunity for people to be creative and people to do things differently. In fact, I'm thinking of writing a blog this weekend on, on lateral thinking and solving the coronavirus and, and climate change. I hope I can get to that. Um, I think we need to look at things very differently. And I, if, we, if we leave it to the 
to the machines and if we leave it to data, I think we lose out a huge opportunity of making decisions that could be very different and could have far better outcomes. I don't think we'll ever, ever say human uh, intervention is, is not required. I think we will always require human intervention, but it's that creativity, I think that's what makes the difference. Machines would get smarter and smarter, and they'll probably start understanding um, sort of sarcastic remarks in, over time, and they'll behave like humans. But I, I, I think there's a long way to go. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of uh, AI and not enough of RI, real intelligence, going around nowadays. So Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. That's true. So I should have been lost in case you're interested on natural intelligence. I mean, you must. You must. You must. We will carry it in transcontinental times uh, on our digital yeah. channel. Yeah. Uh, so Mahesh, it's been absolutely fascinating speaking to you. Thank you. I could thank go on and on. You on. Uh, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Look thank forward you. to nice staying to in you. touch. Have a great evening. Yeah. I know it's close you to your bedtime. You too. You too. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.